see. Are there any questions? Yep. Wow, that's good. You know, Lydia looked at it. <laughs> and then, well, we just, uh, we're a little overwhelmed. <laughs> Um, you're talking about number five, this one that's yeah, yeah. Yeah, and put QI to the height H, right? If you read that in terms of QI, it doesn't really make sense because it's not the form. Yeah. So it can be as simple as that, you know. <laughs> and what is it going to be 1 over comma plus 1? 1 over, over QI plus 1. Over. It'll be something like that, yeah. Q, 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 I, the derivative of QI, like if it is a linear model, that's what will happen. If it is a nonlinear model, in a nonlinear term, when you take the derivative, you need to evaluate them at the steady state. But if it is a linear model, when you take the derivative, it's a constant. The linear model will be applicable for the entire uh, range. In fact, that's one thing that I want to talk to you about. So I'm glad that you asked this question. But uh, do you understand why? The procedure is basically identical to what you did in your previous assignment. Right. So really you're not going to learn anything new in terms of the mechanics. But I, what I want you to learn in the previous assignment, the focus is on multiplicity and stability. So you learn how to calculate the stability, how to get the transfer function when your multiple solutions are on each one of those steady states. Right. And then compare it with the full dynamical model by using what do you call five. Then looking at the transfer function response, the linearized one, you find that it's reasonably good uh, agreement. The linearized model is good over that range. Here, there are two problems that I made up, and uh, one is a vertical tank, the other one is a horizontal tank. Okay. So, <clears throat> what you'll find is when you leave the, the degree of nonlinearity is what the focus is on in this part. It's not on multiplicity or stability, but the degree of nonlinearity. By that, what do I mean? Uh, if you have if it's a straight line like this, it's a linear function, you take the derivative slope as constant. So that model is valid over the entire operating range. Okay. By slightly nonlinear problem, I mean if you plot um, uh, in this case um, the height function, okay, the, the right hand side function, respect to height, you will find something like this, that's gently curved. Okay? So if you take the slope of the function to approximate the derivative, the slope is not going to change whether you are calculating the derivative at the bottom point or at the top point. The slope is going to be slightly changing. Okay? That is really a nonlinear problem. So in that case also the difference between the linearized model, the dynamical response of the linearized model and the full model which you will compare in one of the, I think, so F or something, you'll find that the agreement is reasonably good. It's not very different. The linearized model is good over a whole range of operating conditions. But in the second problem, you will have a highly nonlinear problem like this. So if the steady state is here and you're taking the slope at the bottom, okay, and that slope will not, that more linearized model will not work when you're operating at the now, in the physical context, what is happening in the second problem is you have a tank that is like this. Okay, so you can imagine one way of asking physically is if I add a certain amount of liquid, what is the height change? Okay, in the first problem, you will find if I add QI, okay, by a certain amount, the height change is going to be a certain value. You add twice that, the height change will be twice. Okay? That's why the nonlinearity comes not from the amount of water that you add, but the drainage rate. The drainage rate is proportional to square root of h. 
So that is where the nonlinearity is. In writing Q as equal to some constant times square root of H. That is your nonlinear function. That's what you're linearizing. But in the second problem, if you look carefully, what you'll find is that the nonlinearity comes from the left hand it's not only square root of H, but that you have other terms in the denominator. Where do they come from? And what is the physical meaning of that? The physical meaning you can do the same thought experiment. If I put one liter and when the tank is filling up to this level, what kind of level rise will I get from one liter? As opposed to when the tank is filled up to this, I add the same one liter, what level increase will I get? Can you guess which one will be higher? First one should be higher because its cross sectional area is lower, so the amount of height that it has increased to accommodate this one liter will be much higher in the lower case than the other case. That means that degree of nonlinearity keeps changing with the height. Okay, this is a much more nonlinear problem. And that's what I wanted you to focus on. Otherwise, in mechanics, there should be really nothing new in this problem. If you have the previous um, MATLAB script file, there are two equations. Here you have only one equation. So throw the one equation away, replace the other equation by the right hand side for the two cases. And take the derivative with respect to the state variable, which is h. That is what will give you the Jacobian. In this case, Jacobian is going to be 1. And with respect to the input variable, in this case it is a constant, just one. The function with respect to qi is just one. Okay. And then do the transfer function, the same mechanism that was there uh, in the previous assignment as it was. Okay. And uh, I'm asking you to compare with full integration against ODE45. And when you generate the graphs, you will see a tremendous difference whether you are doing the linearization when the tank is very shallow or when the tank is right somewhere in the middle. Where do you think, again an intuitive question, where do you think the linearization will give you the largest range of operations? But somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle it's going to be least sensitive, okay, because the height change is going to be smallest for the same amount of liquid that you add. Whereas at the bottom, the height change is going to be dramatic. Again, at the top, the height change is going to be dramatic because the area is uh, decreased. Okay. Any other questions? So I'll give you just one week for this one. I think you should be able to do it as long as there are no other conflicts. Are there any other conflicts coming up? Because if all you need to do is cut and paste from the previous assignment and follow the same kind of logic. But the thing that you need to learn is on the physics of it. Why does, understand in your own mind, why does the linearization work well in one case and not so well in another case? And in real plant, you will have this need to retune your linearized models depending on what the steady state operation is. The steady state is drifted, you cannot use the previously developed linearized model with your control system. Okay, so in the last lecture we started looking at examples. I'm going to continue with a few more examples on the same problem, kind of building the whole thing together towards a complete feedback control system. So in the last class we looked at the open loop response. This is the temperature of the exit temperature in the tank, and this is the inlet temperature, and this is the heating rate to the tank. So we looked at how does the response, dynamic response change as we change either TI prime, the inlet temperature, or the flow rate, or a combination of those. So in setting this up, we have discovered that you can, if you know what is the inlet temperature change, you can calculate what is the compensating heat requirement so that the outlet temperature doesn't change. Now there is a good discussion that uh, you can have something called the feed forward control if you have a good model because to calculate what is the effect of changing Ti and the compensating Q, you need to know the model. And if you do that, you can actually implement that kind of a feed forward control action. We will see it later on in the course of many time. But uh, right now, all you're saying is you can develop a table or a chart which tells a manual operator how to adjust Q for a given change in Ti. If you know that the inlet temperature is going to change, then you can take corrective action beforehand in order to keep the upper temperatures constant. Then we saw the next problem, which is focusing on 
the measurement unit alone. So we are focusing on this part actually of the process. First we looked at only the tank, now I'm including the measuring element in there. And there are two parts to this question. The first part is given the manufacturer's data that the thermocouple will respond in 45 seconds and his definition of response is that it will reach 90% of a step change in 45 seconds, kind of the time constant for uh, the measuring instrument. And then the second part is plot the actual and measured response for a step change in 10 degrees to the inner temperature. So now I'm going to change this by 10 degrees and I want to plot what this temperature looks like and I want to plot what this temperature looks like, both P prime and P M prime, the process temperature and the measurement temperature to see what is the lag, what is the problem created by the measurement lag. So this we did in the last class as the first part. We figured out the time constant for the measuring instrument at 0.33 minutes. Okay. The second part says plot the actual and measured response in Simulink for a step change of 10 degrees in the inlet temperature, no change in Q. So no change in Q and that's why I removed this part that we had before. All that is happening is I'm going to put a step change of 10 degrees here and that is going to affect the process temperature, outlet temperature. That is going to be measured and I want to know the difference between the process temperature and the measured temperature. Okay. So if I'm doing it in an exam uh, by hand, this is how I would do it. And then I will show you how to do it in Simulink, even though the problem asks only to be done by Simulink. If I'm doing it by hand, I need to first find out the transfer function between T i prime and T prime because that goes through a transfer. Okay? So that transfer function is, if you know this, it is one, one over W c multiplied by one over W c divided by uh, tau s plus one. So this one over W c will cancel out. So all I have between T i prime, this is T i prime and T prime is 1 over 5s plus 1. That is the transfer function, effective transfer function between the inlet temperature and the outlet process temperature. The inlet temperature is given as 10 degrees step change. And because it is a step change, it is 1 over s. Okay? So Ti prime s is simply 10 divided by s. I make the substitution and I get what the outlet temperature is. Now, you need to do a partial fraction in an exam. You should be able to invert that, and what you will get is this temperature profile for the process temperature 10 times 1 minus e to the power times t over 5. Okay? Then, this process, this process is sampled and put through this transfer function, which I know already. Okay? So, the relationship between t m prime. One and T prime is this. Okay. So I need to apply that, and so when I do that, I get the monitored temperature from the thermocouple as equal to the transfer function for the thermocouple, the transfer function for the process times the step change that I make. Also, you should be able to do in an exam. I'm preparing you for now for the second midterm exam. Okay. So, given that, you should be able to invert that. And uh, I've shown you how to do it in MATLAB, which you all know, using ILAP class. And what you will get is the following expression for the time domain. So, this is Tm. Tm prime as the function of. So we have two analytical expressions. One is T prime, which is given by this. Okay, that is the temperature of the process. And the other one is Tm, uh, Tm prime. I guess I should. This is the temperature from the thermocouple. Okay. And I need to plot these two to compare. Now in an exam I may just ask you to compare at a particular time. 
what is this temperature from the thermocouple, what is the temperature from the process, and what is the difference in the values. So to get an idea of what is the lag, what is the time lag. So in this graph, what you will see is the actual temperature is shown in red, and the thermocouple output is shown in blue. Okay. So the difference, if you take at any point, the difference is going to be the lag. The thermocouple is going to reach the temperature of, for example, 5 degrees at maybe 0 0.1, 0 0.2 minutes later than the actual process temperature. That is a lag. Is this the same as the transportation lag? Transportation lag. You know what a transportation lag is? That's right. So that is the time delay that it takes to get through the pipe, and the transportation lag as a transfer function e to the power minus tau ds. Okay. So my question was, is this the same as the transportation lag, and what is the answer? It's not. It's not because the transfer function is quite different. Okay. So this is a delay caused by a first order delay. So if you look at the difference between the first and the second, what, if I ask you to describe, what is the difference between the first and the second, the red and the blue curve? At every instant of time, if you take a vertical line like this, at every instant of time, the red is above the blue. That means the process has reached a higher temperature at the same time, and the thermocouple hasn't caught up to that. So it's going to take a little longer to reach there. Okay? Okay, that's first observation. Any other observation? What, what about, what, can you say anything about the order of the process? The response of the order? Is it the first order? Is it the second order? Both look like a first order, very close to each other, but this is the red one is truly the first order because that comes from 1 over uh, 5s plus 1. That is the red curve. What is the second one, the blue curve? It's the second order. Okay, because it comes from the product of two first order transfer functions. If you go back here, Tm comes from the product of these two transfer functions. Now, why are they so close to each other? When will they become exactly the same? S equal to zero. This is a kind of a trick question, I guess. At S, S is a Laplace variable, right? So for every S, there is a T. So this, what I'm asking is not at a particular S or at a particular T, when will the two curves become same? When will the two curves merge with each other? Hmm? Never? Yeah, well. Mathematically, but okay. Now you are an instrumentation engineer. You are designing the thermocouple. Can you do something to the thermocouple so that it responds instantaneously? It measures, it senses T, and it sends out the signal T at the same time, not a different signal. What would you have to do to achieve that? Right. <laughs> you are now the designer of the thermocouple. You are not a purchaser. <laughs> What would you do? What, what, what would be your goal to achieve that? That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. Reduce your tau m, the time constant. The reason that these two curves are very close to each other is one time constant is 5. That's the one that determines the general shape of the curve. Okay. For example, how long does it take? It takes about 25 minutes to reach there about 99%, for example. That general shape is determined by the dominant time constant, which is for the process, which is 5. Okay? But the slight delay is 0.33. So if I'm an engineer who is designing a thermocouple, I want this number to be as small as possible. Make it as small as possible. If I make it zero, what happens? Then the two curves merge. They are identical. Okay? Because we have effectively knocked out this term completely. So there is no lag, thermocouple lag. Okay? 
So the first thing that you should notice is this lag is not the same as the transportation lag, which is a pure delay. Okay. The only way that you can get rid of the pure delay is by making the pipeline small, zero. Okay. Whereas in here, by redesigning your thermocouple, you can make this as small as possible, and the smaller it is, the closer the two curves will be. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, but this is truly a second order process, and you know for a second order process, you can have overshoots and uh, oscillations. Why don't we have it here? You know, it's a second order process. What can you say about the zeta that you found in the second order process? to read all these things because I'm going to examine you in the second exam this time as well. Okay. It is a over damp system. In an under damp system you will have overshoot. Okay. Over damp system, damping means it is not allowing oscillation. Okay. So even though it is a second order process, it is similar to an over damp system. Okay. And if you calculate the derivative of this function of the blue curve at zero, what will you get? For the second order process, you should get zero. Okay. So those are all the things that we have learned from the past that you should kind of integrate and uh, understand. Now, this, do you want me to do the similar link or you guys comfortable in doing it by yourself or you want me to do it? Okay. Right. So the problem is we want to plot both the response of the thermocouple and the response of the process. And we know the transfer function. In one case, the transfer function is 1 over 0.33 s plus 1. In another case, it is 1 over 5 s plus 1. And we need to put a step change. Okay. So, start this in a link. And there is one new feature in here that I of simulate that I, I will now. Uh, it's a very minor feature. Okay, what do I need? I need to assemble two transfer functions and a source, which is a step change, and a sink, which displays the result. Those are the tools that I need. So go to the continuous one and cut the set. Oh, the source open up. Uh, as I'm doing, if anything is not clear, please do stop and ask. Okay. So I'm taking the transfer function module, and I'm going to take another one, and I'm going to go to the sources, and I'm going to take a step. <laughs> and then I'm going to the sink. Uh, you can. Uh, no, no, you can't. You can't. A pure transportation delay. Uh, let me physically explain what it is, and then we'll put that and see what what, what happens. Okay. So if I have a response like this from the process, then if I have a transportation delay by Five seconds. All it will do is it will shift it. So it will become like that. Okay. So it's it's a pure shift. So what that means is, if I calculate this at any level of response, if I calculate the time difference, it will exactly be that delay. Whereas what we have seen in this particular problem, if you do the same kind of a analysis, one is this, the other one is something like this. That distance will decrease. Because one is the first order and the other one is the second order. Okay? Yes. Yeah, I will do that. I'm not done this yet. I will do that. Uh, okay. And then I need a scope. Then I want to illustrate this one uh, to work state. 
Can you guess what that would be? It sends the values of whatever is going on that line, the signal, as a variable in your workspace. So if you want to extract this data in a numerical format instead of a graphical one for further analysis, this is the way to one of the ways to get that. So what I've done is I've put a step change which goes through the process uh, types of function. So I need to specify this as y. And then it goes through the measurement one. And that is 0.333. Now if anything that I'm typing here is not clear to you, you need to ask me, okay? You know how these numbers are interpreted, right? So it's the numerator over the denominator. And then I need to set the step change is occurring at zero, and uh, the magnitude is ten. Okay. And uh, any questions? Will this produce the answer to the question that they've asked? Do we need to do anything else? So this is going to produce one graph, and that graph will be the temperature of what? Of the thermocouple. Okay, because it, uh, if I have to plot the temperature of the process, where do I have to sample it? Before that, I need to sample at the point. So I guess I need to kind of break this. Now the problem is demonstrating this. I don't know whether it's really useful. You see what is done, but you don't learn how to do it because that's captured in a keyboard, right? So you need to practice on your own to make sure that uh, you understand that process, okay? So what do I need? I need a must yes, thank you. That's a multiplexer, which takes the signal, two signals. So one is coming from here. The other one is going to come from there. Hope it's clear enough, right? Uh, <coughs> and then I need to now I do the simulation. So what you see is the two curves that we produced. Okay. The beauty of Simulink is you don't need any math, you don't need anything. It's visual, right? But you need to know what a transfer function is, how, how to obtain those numbers that you need to put in. But you don't really need to solve any differential equation or any differential equation. So, um, really a very powerful tool. And uh, I said this will take, sample this line and send a variable to the workspace. So, how does that look in the workspace? So, if you look at the workspace, you don't really see anything new, but if you type code, it has a new variable called simout. Okay, simout is called a structured variable. Okay, so it has a structure to it, and all the variables that are going on that line are um, sent to that particular variable. So, how do you extract the signals out of it? Uh, let's try simout to see whether it gives any additional information. No, it doesn't. Simout. If you just type them out, it says there are signals with one by one structure. Okay. This is something unless you are familiar with structured variables, have you done C plus plus or any structured variables sampled before? Only array. You're familiar with array, right? So structured variable basically in the same variable name you can pass a more complicated data structure. Okay. So it's basically a data based management kind of thing. So here there is a variable called sim out that has in it and signal and signal and this is not in the signal. 
signal to itself is a structure. So in order to get that, what you need to do is type sim out dot signal. Okay. Now it tells you there are two values. Each one is 58 columns and two rows. Okay. So to access those values, what you need to do is sim out dot signal dot value. Do that, then it will print out those numbers. Okay. So if you do this and uh, these are the two temperatures, okay? Temperature of the thermocouple and the temperature of the process. So you may need this data. You may need access to this data, not just a graphical representation, but access to this data to see what is the lag at every instance of time, for example. You have to do some sort of an analysis. Okay. Oh, what, what? Good. What if you want only the first column? What will you do? I think it should work, right? What it does is it says print all the rows on the first column. I think it didn't work. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now let's go back to the delay. Are there any questions on this? So this is the way of communicating. You can ask Simulink to extract data. For example, you have data from a uh, real experiment, physical experiment, temperature which is time in a file. And you want to get that into Simulink, okay? To compare that with the Simulink response for that. So there is something called from workspace, just like to workspace, from workspace. So you can define a variable in workspace and Simulink can pick up pick up that variable from there. Okay. Um, now you wanted to put a delay. Where do, you, where do you want to put the delay? Uh, right after the first time. Right after the first time, so function, okay. okay. Right, yeah. Oh my god, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Let me just grab the delay first, delay function. Uh, where is that? Transport delay, right. So you want me to break this part. Okay, so this one goes to this, right? No? Right, is that what you want? What do you want? I'm just kind uh, <laughs> <laughs> of... Oh, the actual temperature and... Okay, okay. All right, all right, okay. So for that, I need to take the transport and I need to increase the signal to two. Okay. So if I make any mistake in implementing what you want to achieve, let me know. I think <laughs> I don't have a good mouse here, so I'm struggling. No? <laughs> You want the pure transportation delay displayed, okay. and you want this, and then you want um, Okay. Nice drawing, but <laughs> <laughs> because it overlaps there, so you don't really see this. But I think uh, I will open that up so that you can tell me what delay you want. Oh. Can you lay off? Point three three. Yeah. 
No, no, that, that's the time constant. 0.33 is the time constant. Okay, you can try putting 0.33 and see what effect it has. It will have a much more significant effect, I think. Let's try. of the problem. I don't know which one is why, uh, but we have to guess. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll ask you to guess. Right. Yeah. So the blue is the blue or purple one is the pure time delay. If I can figure out. I'm not sure which one. Uh oh, I see. I see. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so now looking at it, can you tell me which is coming from where? The other one is there. I don't know how to change it. <laughs> Hello is the actual process temperature. From the thermocouple. Yeah. Purple would be the one that's coming from the thermocouple. Yeah. 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 So now, now is the question because I, this I have not really planned. But as you're asking the question, questions come to my mind. You asked me to put 0.33, so we did 0.33. And what we notice is there is a significant difference when we change it. But later on, they kind of match. Why is that? We, there is, we are very close. We are on the right path, okay? But what makes that close? What makes that? The other way of phrasing that question is: When does the pure time delay transfer function become equal to a first order transfer function? We saw uh, approximations to the transfer function, the time delay transfer function. Remember the name called it's called Paddy approximation. Which is approximation for e to the power tau s. You can approximate that in terms of a series expansion and truncate it as a first series and second series, which we did about two lectures ago, I think. Okay. And so the pure exponential delay becomes the same as equivalent of first order delay for short time okay, the pure delay. So if, for example, I go back and uh, put this time delay as not 0.33 but 3. Okay. Then what would you expect? So now a delay is definitely like 3. Right? And so the difference is larger. So of course, so very large value. Right. So the exponential transfer function has a good approximation as a first order transfer function, also through the Paddy approximation. Okay, and that's the reason why they gave very close results. Okay. As the time delay becomes smaller and smaller, these two become equivalent, and we saw that analytically why that is so. For the Perry approximation. Okay. This, this, I like this because we're kind of departing from this, but I think it, it makes you think about a lot of these connectivities between very specific things. Uh -huh. Talking about when the pure delay catches up with the first order, but I thought the 
No, it's not more couple there. It's not like a pure research or something. I'll show you. Go back. I don't know how you were comparing it. Yeah, the first one is the thermal couple output, where the other one is that process temperature. Okay. So the process temperature output is related to the inlet temperature. What is happening is the inlet temperature is changing by 10 degrees. And the question is, how does the outlet temperature of the process tank change? That's the first order process. Okay. First order transfer function. Yeah. Then that we are dipping now the thermal couple and saying what is coming out of the thermal couple. That is the purple line. Because the thermal couple doesn't instantaneously read the temperature of the out. There is a lag. Okay. That lag is not a pure transformation lag, it's a lag because of the dynamic response of the thermal couple itself. It needs to heat up the element. Yeah, the, in the problem that I posed, we are asked to compare only the process temperature with the thermal temperature to understand how big is the delay, the magnitude. Okay, and then uh, I think Jason asked, what would it look like if we have a delay, a pure transportation delay? That's when I put the third graph, just to show. And I think I learned a lot by <laughs> comparing it to approximation. Right, right. Let me go to that uh, note, maybe. Ah, good. See, this is a nice thing that you can do. That's a, uh, but we can go forever. So, <laughs> what I like is some of you are actually teaching me. <laughs> Something I wanted to share with you. I think it was Danica, I guess, uh, came to my office and said, I want to automate this whole process, okay, in the previous assignment. And there was a block there on how to extract the numerical and the numerical and denominator coefficients from the symbolic transfer function. I didn't know the answer. And then I guess she found it out and sent me an email. I felt very good. If every one of you can be like that, learn on your own. I have done my purpose. I don't, you don't need me anymore. <laughs> my job is to make myself irrelevant. <laughs> All right? So um, I think those kind of things are important. So you should, when you ask a question, I may not be able to, I may not just have the time to do it in the class, but please feel free to play with it later on, okay? And uh, discover some of those answers by yourself. Now what I was going to show you was uh, why the, I think it was 18, Yeah, here it is. Okay. So we're talking about the pure transportation delay, and that is always given by a transfer function like this, e to the power minus s times tau. So that is a pure transportation delay. But you can write that as 1 over e to the power st and then do a series expansion. Now, if tau, the transportation delay magnitude, is small, then when you do tau square, tau cube, they are going to be smaller. Okay. So you can say, I'm going to drop cut off this term. And then it looks like it's a first order. Okay, so in that limit you cannot tell. If tau, the transportation delay is small, you cannot really tell whether it is caused by it's caused by transportation delay or a first order delay. Okay, they both merge to be the same. That is what we saw in the first graph. Now by simply increasing tau the delay magnitude and saying now we cannot do that, we need to keep more terms. Now, there are better ways of still modeling that e to the power minus s t, and these are through the first and second order Faraday approximation. You can write e to the power minus s t by splitting it in the numerator and denominator like that, do a series expansion, and truncate. And you'll find that this, and this is in the form of numerator over denominator, but it captures the pure, pure delay in a more accurate way. But the most accurate way is to actually use e to the power minus st, and there is a block and symbol to do that. So really, there's no need to 
So it's only when you're doing by hand. In an exam, this will be important. If I say there is a pure time delay, you need to be able to approximate it by this and then use that in uh, partial fraction. Yeah? Because that's uh, e to the power minus. When you do the expansion of e to the power minus x, you get 1 minus x plus x squared over 2 minus x to the power 3. Okay, that's just an expansion. E to the expansion. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, uh, no, almost the same as the first order transfer, first order transfer function. That's okay. That's a good observation. <laughs> Why does the response still look like a second order one? Because the transportation delay itself looks first order, but there is another first order process. So we are comparing the outlet temperature, right? So it's going through two first order transfer functions, product of two first order transfer functions. That's why. The response of the thermocouple always will look like a uh, second order with a zero slope at the end. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so that's, so I think, about the second problem I wanted to do. I'm going to maybe. Yeah, here I just show you. Uh, I called. Remember, by default, when we did this, I didn't give it a name. But in the in this worksheet, I called the variable as temp. So in the workspace, it'll appear as temp dot time, temp dot signals dot value. Okay. Now, when you are creating that, how do I get the time value? That's the question, I guess. structure with time. If you select that, then it sends also the time values, which are accessible then uh, in the workspace through temps.time. Because temps is a variable name I've given. Okay. But default it will have, uh, I think, something called what was this workspace. Simount. It was called simount. Okay, the third question is the one, I guess it will probably we'll finish it in the next class, is putting all of them together. Okay, so here now you're told use simulink to find the response of the complete closed loop system for a controller gain of 20. Okay, so first we did only the process, then the process and the measurements. Now we're going to put the feedback loop. So it's now a closed loop, it's no longer an open loop. So here is the process transfer function, and here is the heater, the gain, which would be the 1 over WC, okay, and here is your controller gain that is given. And this is what you would tune as a control engineer, you would try to change that and see how it affects the response. And here is the measurement. So all the elements come together, and this is a feedback signal. So the signal is going this way. Whereas here, what am I doing? I'm just plotting the step change, happening the step change and plotting it. Okay. So we'll go through this, I guess, in the next slide. Okay. Any other questions? I think so, yeah, yeah.